Okay. Uh, well, welcome everybody. Nice to see uh, your faces, albeit on screen. Uh, my name is Tommy O'Halloran. I am the president of the New York City chapter of Cornet, and we're thrilled to be bringing you this program today from the uh, SPP, the Strategy and Portfolio Planning Committee. Um, the topic is a great one that I'll let Stephen introduce. It's been um, at the center of many of our conversations that are in the commercial real estate industry right now, not just on the construction side, but from design and and brokerage and end users. So I think it's a it's a great uh, timely topic, and we've got a great panel. Um, but just by way of a, a few announcements on the chapter, we are uh, we do, we're fresh off of the retreat, the membership. I'm sorry, the volunteer and the board retreat, which is the weekend before last. Got a lot of feedback from our volunteers. I know many of the attendees here are volunteers of the chapter, and we're we're thrilled. We think it's a very exciting time for the chapter because we're coming off of two years of not really being in person and. <clears throat> Knock wood, we're, we're confident and we're, we're hoping that we can really do that this year because for, every, for everybody to get the engagement that they seek out of Cornet, you know, doing it in person is, is such a key component and we're optimistic that we're doing that. The committees that put on content, SPP being one of them, have all been charged with you know looking at their upcoming events, uh, whether they're entirely in person or hybrid. Uh, we really want to get our membership back together uh, in front of people and we're so, starting to see the slow, city slowly return. So we're thrilled about that. And as always, we'd like to thank our sponsors and our members who are, are um, returning their membership now and their sponsorship. So thank you to all. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to the SPP current chair, uh, who will talk about a little, uh, the, the panelists and a little bit about the, um, the game rules here of how to engage while we're going through the program. So Stephen, take it away. Perfect. Thanks, Tommy. Um, welcome, everyone, to today's panel titled Supply Chain 2020, The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. I'm Stephen Coulthard, part of the senior management team at Cumming Group and chair of Cornet New York Chapters Strategy and Portfolio Planning Committee, where we focus on the issues real estate leaders need to know to talk to their businesses. Today's call will follow our usual format of a 30-minute panel conversation, followed by 20 minutes Q&A. To allow the Q&A to be interactive, we do not control your audio and video. So if you're not on the panel or a moderator, please turn them off now and keep the comments and questions coming through the chat. The more interactive, the better. When we do get to the Q&A, David, our moderator today, will call out individuals to turn on their audio and video to ask the questions they raised in the chat. Today's topic, Supply Chain 2022, was chosen as it has become the greatest challenge to delivering capital projects today. Our panel, comprised of a client, a project manager, a contractor, and an attorney, will speak to how they dealt with supply chain challenges in 2021 and what risks they foresee in 2022 and how they plan to manage them. So without further ado, let's meet our panelists. Our client, Jonathan Cogswell, manages Northwell Health's operations and development in their Western region, which includes Lenox Hill Hospital, Manhattan Eye, Ear and Throat Hospital, Lenox Health Greenwich Village, and an outpatient network of 80 sites. If anyone hasn't seen Netflix's medical documentary about the heroics that happen at Lenox Hill, then please add it to your list. Our project manager, Gavin Middleton, who with Peter Lehrer leads the East Coast operations of Cumming Group, the largest pure play project management firm in the US. Having spent six years leading construction and development at Starwood Capital, Gavin and his team have an enviable reputation for delivering the highest profile and complex capital projects in the city. Our contractor, David Hamilton, who leads Structuretorn's New York purchasing department, together with the purchasing, procurement, and supply chain strategy for Structuretorn groups, companies across the US and Canada. Our attorney, Michael Ferry, who concentrates on construction law at Dew and Morris, assisting developers and lenders. And finally, to our moderator, who is always playing the good, Mr. David Horowitz. David has extensive experience of delivering projects around the world, is a fellow member of SPP and the ORPM Alliance, and Emeritus Regional Director at Collier's Project Leaders. So with all of that, I will hand over to David. Enjoy the panel and keep the questions coming. Over to you, David. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Tommy, for uh, getting uh, Cornet re-engaged in person in the future. We're all looking forward to that. Uh, today, we are looking at 
um, the supply chain issue um, from a wide variety of um, panelists uh, representing uh, different components of the real estate design and construction industry. Um, and as opposed to um, the title, Supply Chain 2022, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, we're actually going to start with the ugly and wind up with the good. So David Hamilton, um, as um, a panelist that uh, represents folks that are at the coal face, so to speak, why don't you describe for us um, an example of something that's occurred on a project or multiple projects that you as a, a supply chain guru would consider an ugly situation, one where um, you know, the structure tone organization couldn't necessarily solve by itself um, initially, but uh, you're starting to tackle now. So let's, let's hear about an ugly situation from David. David, thanks so much. And it really is an honor to, to share with all my fellow panelists here today. Um, something with regard to the supply chain, you begin to look at it in the last couple of weeks even uh, and begin to realize just how deep and how wide and there's such a plethora of different avenues that we could go down and talk about issues that are, are really beginning to, to become even harder uh, to circumnavigate the one that I, I would kind of highlight uh, in a company that, that prides itself in handing over spaces that are complete, this might sound maybe fairly innocuous, but, but an, even an item like appliances, um, trying to hand over and complete spaces that, that don't have appliances that whenever we're doing the larger amenity spaces uh, and a company, like I say, that, that prides themselves and giving our, our clients, servicing our clients to the highest possible level, and running into that barrier and there's no railway around it. Um, once uh, we've learned an awful lot through COVID for the last couple of years and understanding just how that's funneled through probably one major supplier in the US uh, and the roadblock that we find with that has been, has been ugly. It's been very, very difficult to deal with having to put in temporary appliances at best and, and very often even just having to push that way out beyond completion dates embarrassing for a GC to take something that might be sound so simple as an appliance and yet so important whenever we're trying to bring millennials and everyone back to the office to not have those pieces of equipment in place. Definitely very difficult to deal with. Thank you, David. Uh, I guess another ugly component aside from an actual fixed asset, Gavin, do you have an example that you'd like to share today of a, a non- physical item that is a supply chain or has been a supply chain issue and what um, you have found on your projects. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to uh, contribute to this. Um, I'm really spoiled for choice in terms of what to talk about. Uh, and, and with regards to the ugly, I'll, I'll, I'll just pick one. We have the privilege of managing a luxury residential project uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. Unusually for Atlanta, uh, the facade material that was selected was a handset uh, limestone. Um, we negotiated a contract with a very prominent uh, European subcontractor to uh, supply and install um, said limestone facade. Um, that uh, subcontract was bargained on the basis of importing uh, European labor that was um, experienced in a unique anchorage system that was used um, for the limestone facade. Then COVID arrives, um, no transatlantic travel, and all of a sudden I don't have an installer uh, to install my limestone, which we had proactively managed to uh, get into the, the, uh, the United States in advance of, of all of the shipping challenges, which I'm sure we'll talk more about um, in a few minutes. Um, the uniqueness of the anchorage system uh, meant that um, local labor was unwilling uh, to install the limestone. Um, so we ended up uh, tamping windows, uh, waterproofing the facade, re resequencing a lot of exterior work. Um, and that ultimately was the best um, bad option uh, that we could uh, present to our clients. So it was, uh, it was probably on the, the higher end of the ugly scale there. Thank you, Gavin. Well, let's, let's uh, hear from a client perspective, uh, Jonathan, 
uh, you've had to deal with uh, ugly situations and you're in a highly regulated industry, which was at the front end of uh, COVID from a client patient perspective, but you also were managing capital projects in the midst of all that. Are there any particular areas that you'd like to identify that are um, were ugly for the Northwell organization? Sure, thanks, David, and uh, it's it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, I, I, I as I kind of look back on these things, I, I I'm I'm kind of surprised to see some of the challenges we're facing that I. Is it was never something I thought we would face. You know, some things that are are not accessible that normally are the easy parts, right? So, I, like I think back to uh, a, a, an MRI project we were doing that required a new air handler, and um, normally when you think about delays in air handlers, it's because they can't get the fan from Europe or they can't get this or. Uh, and we get a call a week before delivery from our manufacturer saying we got all the parts and pieces but I can't get the enclosure. And, and, and I'm, I'm shocked by that. I'm like, well, what do you mean you can't get the enclosure? You, you, you got all the hard parts, you can't get the easy part. Um, and, and it's then, you know, we literally had the manufacturer ship us all the parts and pieces and had our local tin knocker build an enclosure for it so we could deliver it on time and get it here because, you know, it, it, we're very much in a, you know, speed to market world right now as, as you know, most people are, but, um, and, and when I have an MRI coming and, and getting set in place, if I can't cool that unit, I can't deliver that unit. Um, and uh, definitely much harder to get an MRI in place than it is for me to get an air handler in place. So uh, we had to do whatever we could do. And luckily we were able to, to custom fabricate something, but it, it, it's seeing challenges in the supply chain now that are things that would never have crossed your mind in the past is, is what is, I think, really kind of blowing me away about all this. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Michael, obviously some of these uh, supply chain challenges have wind up as significant disputes between uh, suppliers and contractors and or, or designers and owners and or owners and contractors. Can you um, represent or, or describe an issue that you saw in the past and how you and your firm dealt with it and how all of the, all of the members of the design and construction and real estate industry are getting challenged from a legal perspective? Sure, and thank you. It's great to be here as well. And and just in that regard, you know, we have seen uh, issues where, uh, in sort of the physical sense, where products have not, uh, price have fluctuated. So uh, prices of items are going up and they're going down. And the question is, you know, who is responsible for timing that market properly in, in such a case? And, and when we're seeing supply chains being squeezed and prices fluctuating accordingly. And I have seen examples where the contractor chose perhaps you know, to wait a little bit, not purchase a, a particular material that was at one time feeling a very intense fluctuation. But then when they were timing the market down, the price switches and it goes back up and now they're in a, uh, now they're in a loss. And we've seen that in, in so really a, a more of a supply chain, but a market tightening on certain products. And if your contractor is in a position where now operating at a loss, it's a problem for everybody. And it's, and you know, if you use your contract as a sword, which, which you know some people have considered, you have an issue where you might not be able to get your project completed. So you know, people might walk. So we, we've had to deal with, even if we're in a position of contractual strength, the owner is still going to assume some costs in regards to getting a contractor to take on some of these, uh, you know, these price changes that have taken place. So uh, that's where we've seen some of the um, you know challenges and and owners and contractors both sharing the burden of these changes. Well, I'm I'm going to move ahead now and start uh, as we've heard uh, several ugly stories here. I'm going to ask the panelists to describe uh, situations that were bad that have been turned around or good. Um, 
items that they've modified their operating procedures or methods of planning a project or interactions with um, uh, the real estate industry, design, or contractors um, that are now items that they're going to be doing in on a go forward basis. So um, again, Michael, is there anything from a legal perspective that you're advising clients to be aware of uh, or incorporate into contracts on a go forward basis um, related to insurance or force majeure or anything that are going to be protecting folks on a uh, against the issues that we've seen and you've seen in the past. Sure. And there are some, the, the tools that have been available to the industry have, have been here. So these aren't new tools. It's just focusing on them in a, in a little, you know, uh, more focused to address these particular items. And so one item we've seen more owners be appreciative to is that is the pre-construction agreements and pre-construction methods, getting the construction professionals in the job sooner. Uh, to help identify supply chain shortages and maybe perhaps substitutions. Uh, we've seen early procurement as a possible solution. Uh, that's getting the, the products that are uh, at risk in the hand sooner, and that involves certain costs. You're gonna have more insurance costs and, and storage costs involved with that. And then obviously the, uh, the force majeure clause is focusing on that, but I think that's, uh, that's on everyone's forefront now. So that's usually something that's, that's been hit, but. Uh, also, a uh, alternate dispute resolution and making sure you have the ability to do that virtually, which speeds it up faster and, and gets the parties talking about issues sooner rather than letting them fester and turn into bigger problems. Thank you. Jonathan, obviously, um, in a practice that uh, where you are, where you have a couple of major hospitals plus many outpatient locations, um, you're dealing with pretty wide range of uh, factors uh, and project times and durations that go from, you know, multi-year down to multi-week. Um, how have you approached uh, supply chain uh, problems having seen the ugly and the bad in the past? And what are you, what are you doing in the future that supports uh, a newer way of doing things? Um, I, you know, I think uh, as a whole, we're starting to look more at, um, at uh, bulk purchasing. Um, you know, I, I, you, you, you know what I'm responsible for, but we as Northwell are, are 23 hospitals and over 900 uh, ambulatory facilities and, and, and a slew of other types of facilities. And, you know, so we have, we have a, a pretty large scale buying power and and looking at at leveraging some of the relationships we have with vendors and and figuring out ways that we may be able to bulk purchase items that we use as standards across our health system and start stocking them you know when i think back to um you know the height of COVID at the very beginning you know on a micro scale to that you know one of the things we did here at lennox is we took the auditorium at lennox and turned it into a home depot because we didn't know what we were gonna need. We didn't know when we were gonna need it in order to respond and create facilities uh, on, a, on a rolling ongoing basis to support what was coming down the pike. And we literally filled our auditorium with studs, sheetrock, lights, diffusers, ceiling tiles, and just to, to know that we had it and that we could, have, could access it at a moment's notice as we were going down the pike. So kind of taking that onto a macro level and, and saying, you know, how can we do this um, in a cost-effective manner, but to be able to try to prepare ourselves for the future and challenges that may that may arise, I think is, is really one of our big pushes. And, and then the, the relationships we forge with, with local vendors and local suppliers is, is key. It's, it's being able to, to, to have backup plans to your backup plans. Um, to, to, to get your hands on items that, um, that are, are, can be next to impossible to get. Thank you, Kevin. Obviously the uh, items that Michael spoke about and Jonathan spoke about um, 
make a complex situation even more complex, what are you seeing and what are you advising clients uh, to do um, given those complexities or other complexities that Cummings may have uh, come across? You know, I think there's a uh, even greater responsibility on on uh, project managers, owners, reps, developers, uh, clients to have a much better understanding of the entire vendor supply chain that's necessary to um, deliver a product uh, to our job site. You know, hardwood flooring is uh, is an interesting uh, case in point. Um, certain species and grades of of material especially if they're required in longer lengths, are really becoming extraordinarily difficult to find in the types of quantities needed on larger projects. And if you're working on large residential hospitality or, or commercial projects that have a requirement for you know, significant quantities of, of hardwood flooring, um, I would highly encourage your antenna to be um, raised um, proactive construction managers like Structure Tone, my friends on the phone, um, have had strategies in place for a long time to um, early harvest and, and, and storage board month over month, um, well before the first board is ever needed on a job site, typically at least a year in advance of that timeline, um, so that when we get on site um, and we need hardwood flooring, we have enough um, backlog of material um, to uh, get us to the end of the job. Yet in COVID, many of those mills closed in 2020 because of just a complete collapse in, in, in demand. Many did not reopen in, in 2021. And um, now we're in a position that demand has surged again. The mills that are open are really struggling to keep up, can't find enough labor um, to run those mills um, with the hours that they'd like to. And um, all of a sudden we have um, real challenges on a number of projects across the country and supplying uh, the volume of material needed to sustain the progress we need to keep um, the job moving. That's led us to require um, um, flooring subcontractors to identify more than one supplier for larger projects. We're insisting on them using um, more than one supplier and you know understanding where the raw material is coming from, building relationships with the mill itself so that we get you know, uh, accurate information as to production timelines and deliveries um, is a necessity of our business. So I think it's 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 led us to be uh, much more informed about the entire vendor supply uh, chain that's um, that's needed to deliver a product. Thank you, Gavin. David, why don't you build on that and talk about um, what you as a individually and, and your organization have done in terms of looking into the supply chain in ways that when you probably started doing purchasing as an individual or as a group, you weren't doing. And, and you see that as a, as a way of operating now that is, you know, has to happen. Thanks, David. Yeah, no, that's, that's a, Great question, and and just you know I uh, hardly back off everything that Gavin has said. Um, the the issue that the way I see it is that material and equipment was always second tier to us, so it was always something that, that our subcontractors bought. We certainly knew we had relationships, we knew who certain people were, and some of the air conditioning manufacturers, etc. But we never really treated those relationships tremendously seriously. What really happened, and the catalyst for all of this, I believe, was COVID. To, to really have us take it <laughs> beyond serious and, and really start to roll up our sleeves and drive those relationships much, much deeper. So what we did was we, we gathered our group, which we always had uh, in the background, a center of excellence innovation for purchasing. Uh, we had a group that's staffed by members of uh, right across the entire structure tone organization across North America and, and right up into Canada. And what we did was we started to meet on a very regular basis early in COVID. We started to share a lot of information. A lot of this is down to communication, obviously. And we put in a, a couple of shared uh, spreadsheets to number one, begin to share contacts of, of all of the, the manufacturers that we do, to begin to share the, the relationships that we have 
across all of the offices and begin to leverage and understand where we, we had various geographic locations where some of these factories are also located, which was obviously a, a leverage then for us to be able to, to step out and, and form new relationships as well. Um, since and right the whole way through COVID, we've been meeting at least weekly with that group to share then the, the issues that we're seeing in supply chain to try to gain better visibility up and downstream in the supply chain. It is very inherently difficult. Uh, I'll name one of them as lighting. It, it's just, it's such a, a network and it's, it's very, very difficult to manage, but just really pushing the limits with the relationships at the CEO level of, of very large companies, getting an understanding of what their throughput is, what their issues are, recording those and then sharing them across with the team. One of the big things that we're really tackling recently, and this is a development maybe even in the last month, is really rolling out a much better system for, for what we call our hot list tracking at a job site level. So things that we would typically have relied upon on a submittal log is really taking those and putting those into a separate log. And we're trying to, to really understand how we can utilize that much better, centralize it, share it, and then have people like myself and some of my other colleagues here begin to leverage the relationships that we have, not just with our subcontractors, but even using our subcontractors because they're the ones that have the, the financial leverage many times with some of these manufacturers, but developing those manufacturer relationships much, much further up. I'll ask uh, you, David, or any of the panelists to indicate, um, let's look at the you know, the wider vision here, are there any components that you see that have been a problem that essentially the problem is virtually disappear or, or is on the way of disappearing? And are there items that you see as, you know, no end in sight in terms of um, uh, being problematic and, and not having a, uh, a solution that owners, designers, everybody should be aware of on a go forward basis. Anybody have any examples? I, I would say, David, just real quick, uh, you know, I'll not take too much time, but uh, I would say electrical uh, gear and goods at the minute. Uh, so what we call panel guts and breakers are, are two items that are really very, very difficult to source and the shortage in them, you know, is is pretty dire at the minute, and it is going to have a fact, a big effect with permanent power. Um, whenever we are turning over items like smaller data centers, IDF rooms, and even finished uh, finished floors, so uh, definitely one that is a very hot topic and one that we're discussing a lot internally at the minute. Anybody else have any uh, ugly? examples of supply chain challenges? David, I think any, any product, that, uh, just briefly, I think any product that uh, arrives in the US through a West Coast port um, continues to be a, a, an extraordinary challenge. I think the East Coast ports have really got their act together now, uh, but West Coast really remains a complete crapshoot. And we've added multiple weeks to all of our timelines uh, for product delivery, uh, just to reflect that. And uh, would you say European products getting shipped to the East Coast are in better shape than Asian products uh, in general? Or Absolutely, I, I would say that, yep. Okay. Are there um, uh, any examples uh, from any of the panelists of items that have been problematic in 2020 or 2021? that are pretty much resolved now. Yes, David, I could speak to that. I mean, the force majeure claims that we were seeing in, in 2020, have, uh, in my experience, have all but uh, you know, faded away. There are still obviously issues in, in particular chains in the supply market, but the general idea that this there's things were unknown or unavoidable or, or were unaware of it, I, those have sort of uh, settled out. Uh, most force majeure claims now will include an understanding that the parties are aware of 
COVID-19 issues or certain supply chain issues or certain, or certain even uh, material issues, and they've accommodated it, they've addressed it, it's part of the risk in addressing the contract. So uh, I think that that's one area where we've seen claims sort of uh, settle out at this time. Michael, are there, aside from uh, getting an agreement of, of client and uh, other party uh, regarding force majeure, are there other legal protective devices that you would recommend are considered for supply chain issues? Well, I, I mentioned one of the key ones earlier, and that is the idea of early procurement. And, and other parties have mentioned it as well, as far as getting items stocked and, and warehoused. Uh, that allows the parties an understanding that you know, you're going to issue a deposit. That deposit will be used for purchasing materials at the current price and the current lead time. And, and that's sort of baked in. And there are additional costs attached to that. But that additional price does provide extra certainty. Uh, and so uh, that's one area where the parties have, have found uh, agreements. There's also a, you know, price escalation provisions. That's something that the industry has been talking about and it's very common in, in the public sector. So the private sector has been taking better advantage of, of those items for you know, allowance items, uh, certain items where the parties can agree on what the current cost will be when issues, when there is time for procurement and providing a, a range of acceptable costs that would uh, apply in the event of uh, escalation. Thank you. Uh, David, I do think, David, I do think it's worth a, a moment on labor. I think we obviously during COVID dealt with, you know, challenges um, across our industry um, for various reasons. Um, but I think there was a lot of concern around the, uh, at the turn of the year when the NYC vaccine uh, mandate was introduced and, you know, a lot of speculation as to the percentage of of the trades that would not be vaccinated and, and impacts that would have on our, on our numbers on our job sites. But we've actually seen the industry uh, respond uh, remarkably well um, to that. And I think we're now seeing, um, you know, numbers on our job sites um, really back at uh, pre-pandemic levels, which is, you know, highly encouraging. Thank you, Gavin. I was gonna ask, are there any uh, particular labor sectors that have been more affected than others, steel workers or um, steam fitters or uh, any particular sectors that uh, either you or David um, have seen um, falling behind and struggling to catch up? Not, not currently. I would have to echo what, what Gavin has said. Um, you know, the industry has responded very well. Uh, Local 3 still has their furlough program, which is always a good barometer of whether there's full employment or not. So uh, that furlough is still in place, as far as I know. And, uh, you know, that, that is an indicator that we watch for. But for the most part, no, we haven't seen a massive drop off, David, in, in too many areas so far, thankfully. Material is just the uh, definitely the bane of the existence. Anything that has a widget or a, a component or a you know, a, a circuit in it is uh, is something that you want to be very worried, very concerned about these days. And I and I think that's where the labor challenges lie. You know, a lot of the labor challenges lie not not on our job sites, but at the manufacturers of 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 the widgets, and and actually being able to you know get your hands on the product. <clears throat> David, I know that you're doing a deeper dive on. Um, with manufacturers and or suppliers, um, what would you say to an owner or members of design and construction team? How deep is a good standard practice now to go in the manufacturing side? Because obviously if someone's an assembler or uh, uh, relying upon other components from other manufacturers, you know, the supply chain goes on at infinitum. What would you say is a good standard operating procedure for people to consider and, and use? I would have to say, David, that, that there's no holes barred and there's no there's nothing wrong with reaching out further up the chain. We, we tend to have through the years been an industry that we, we tend to be very localized. We tend just to, to call a local rep and believe everything they're saying to us where there's no real harm in, in calling the CEO of, you know, Armstrong or, 
or other products, you know, and really building a relationship and, and have them hand you off to the local person or maybe a more regional person to really get a true story as to what their vision is for the future of the true issues that they're having because the reps may not have entirely a full picture. I hope there's no rep on the phone that's going to, or on the, <laughs> online that's going to call me afterwards and ring me. But, uh, you know, they certainly have a job to do. They have a relationship. They're trying to sell products. We totally get that. But, I, you know, what has been in, instrumental, I think, in really us moving a needle has been calling further up the chain and, and really find out the best way to either, do we have to expedite it? Can we expedite it? Is there additional monies that can be paid or can we substitute it? You know, design community you just had mentioned. Uh, so, so the three ways that we approach it, either expedite, substitute or stockpile. Those are the three main avenues that we see that, that are there for, for our clients and, and our design teams. So, and each one of those have to be looked distinctly uh, as a fit for that particular product, product and also that particular project. So uh, each of them fit within their own uh, boundaries, if you like. So uh, yeah, just pushing the envelope and, and calling further up. Right. I, I was struck by or remembered that you mentioned the word expedite, and we talked about actual install labor. Um, I'm wondering if any of you want to chat about the regulatory environment, New York, um, and how that's been affected by COVID or lack of labor at the regulatory agencies and what each of you are doing about it in your own way. Um, anybody want to speak to FDNY, DOH, DOB? Silence. Silence. <laughs> uh, David, David, you're recording this. So we can't possibly be expected to comment. <laughs> Jonathan from uh, no, I think I, I think you know I, I honestly I think they're as challenged as we are they they you know they're they're being asked to to maintain the the work that that they do on a normal basis and yet or uh, uh, when, when I look at my world you know you're you're calling the department of buildings say come to my hospital and and inspect this job site you know they may not be super comfortable doing that and, you know, and, and it's, and I can't fault them for, you know, not necessarily wanting to step into the, you know, in the middle of everything and, and, and look at a job and they're trying to work with us on these things. I know FDNY worked with us hand in hand uh, during, during the whole pandemic. They, you know, when we had emergency oxygen trailers and we had, a, you know, a, emergency situations, they worked with us hand in hand, as did the Department of Health. Um, you know, so I think they're, they're doing their best to to uh you know to to work with us and keep things moving and they're they're trying to adapt to the challenges that that we're all facing um you know and and we'll, we all just need to figure out how to get there together thank you uh steven should we move to questions as it's uh 140 at this point yeah that, that's good david do you want to um, start with larry sure larry charlotte yeah, I, I, I had two. I had two questions, but uh, the first one was kind of answered already. Um, we talked about contractual. Um, so you guys talked already about contractual um, components to kind of help offset cost of the uh, of the supply chain issue. My other question is, <clears throat> how has the trucker strike in Canada affected the supply chain here in the U.S.? And do we do we think that something similar is going to happen here, um, as we were talking about labor, but you know, transportation is a big part of it as well. Anybody have any uh, Canadian suppliers delayed to uh, sites in uh, the last couple of weeks? I think the answer to that is if we had the goods, we could always get them here. But, uh, you know, part of the problem is getting them manufactured, um, you know, and that's that's really what we're we're kind of really struggling with more so than the trucking. I haven't heard so much really of disruption around the trucking uh, side of things. So I would, for one, would have to say I haven't heard of that being used as a quote unquote excuse uh, or a reason just yet. Yeah, I'd echo that. I think typical products, precast um, case goods, a lot of them come from Canada. We haven't, we haven't, we haven't seen that uh, 
that uh, reason used in the last uh, few weeks. Thank you, Gavin. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, and, and, and David, David, just to push in that, that there was a question from Morgan as well, who, which was a, a little bit related to that as far as shortage of labor and transit. Is that related to transportation of goods and materials yeah. to sites? Yeah. Uh, anybody have find that as an issue? Uh, it definitely was an issue a couple of weeks ago, maybe even a couple of months ago. Uh, Omicron, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, I've got an accent. Um, virus and the upsurge in that definitely had a big effect on trucking. Um, but then we saw that assuage very quickly afterwards. So I have not heard of that being a, a huge issue since then. Uh, the last few weeks has been pretty good. But what has really hardened, and I've said it a few times already, is the electrical and the components side of things that that's what's really taken a, a very much a hardening approach. Hey, Dave, if I could jump in. Um, early on, you had written in one of your white papers that there was like an Amazon effect. Was 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 Is that still affecting trucking right now where, you know, many of the truckers that were out of work were hired by Amazon and didn't want to go back to the regular uh, shipping routes? Is that still in play? It, it was at one point, I mean, uh, the American Association of Trucking put out a number of bulletins crying out for people to, to join and, and sign up. And there, there has been a whole recruitment drive. I think the numbers that were projected, uh, there's something around usually uh, a need for around 50,000 truckers in the US and they were projecting they needed 80. Um, so it was a big jump. Um, that seems to have quietened down a little bit since then. I haven't heard it mentioned just as much. So I'm assuming all it's good news, hopefully. Sorry, on a, on a similar note um, to the Amazon effect, my understanding was a lot of the, the shipping supply chain issues where Amazon, Walmart, Home Depot buying up all of the containers coming out of, particularly coming out of Asia um, and, and people not being able to get products on, on containers. Has that eased up? I know you, you guys talked about the East Coast ports have gotten better, the West Coast ports still being a problem, but getting product here from those in containers, is that still an issue? Uh, I think definitely for Asia product, um, it absolutely is. And I think one of the, one of the interesting uh, um, situations that's emerged is the fact that just because a, a, a product is onboarded at a port in Asia, doesn't mean it's necessarily going directly to the port in the United States that you think it's going to. Um, and we've had, and are dealing with, you know, a number of instances at the moment where a product's been um, um, taken to another port, removed from the container ship, um, left at another port for several weeks before um, being um, onboarded onto another ship and then making its way to, um, to the port that it was originally intended to. So what we're seeing is, you know, the demand from Asia to the US uh, really just can't be uh, satisfied. And so, we're seeing some circuitous routes of containers, um, and that's why we've added so much time to the to the timelines, um, you know, and advising our clients accordingly. There definitely is a problem with the visibility into the supply chain and understanding the manufacturing side of things, but as well as that, the shipping Gavin just mentioned, and the tracking and the ability to track those goods is is kind of very inadequate at the minute. I feel um, we are dedicating a lot of resources at the project level to track materials uh not just what i'd said earlier with submittal logs but really taking that to a whole new level of trying to to find out when goods are supposed to show up uh, and then also you know hearing two days before they show that that piece of, of equipment didn't make it or that it's stuck somewhere along the line those stories are, are day and daily um there just seems to be so much of that and it is not going away. Uh, I thought by now it would, if you'd asked me six weeks ago, I thought it was tailing off a little bit. Uh, we're finding recently it has gone through a big uptick and uh, a lot of surprises. So you don't want to be caught. Make sure that that second, third phone call, or, you know, and even at that, at times we're still being, uh, commitments are not being held, which is surprising. It's, 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 it's amazing, David, how it's, how there seems to be a disconnect within the manufacturers that you know you're you have call after call after call confirming schedule confirming schedule confirming schedule and then the next day you get an email by the way we're two months behind 
and you know, I, we just talked Friday and it's Monday. What changed over the weekend? You know, what, how, how did this, you know, it, it's, it, and that seems to be almost increasing right now. Talking about communications, um, all of us have dealt with have, having to explain a supply chain impact to clients. Uh, in your case, Jonathan, your clients, users, doctors, um, major components of the hospital. Um, how, how have you um, explained or communicated to clients regarding uh, supply chain impacts to projects that have occurred in the past or are underway now where you used to have uh, X week or X month period of time, and now it's X plus, um, or maybe X with no known delivery date. Jonathan, anything that I mean, you- Personally, for, for, from my perspective, we're very honest up front. And when we have these conversations and we talk schedule internally, we're, we're, we're very clear that, you know, here is our assumed schedule on this project, but I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not casting this in stone until I have everything in my hands because I don't know. I mean, I literally have been working on a project for six months and the key to the project are sterilizers. And I have everything in my hands and Monday they call and say the sterilizers are two months delayed. There, there's nothing I can do about that. I can't create a sterilizer at a, you know, it's, it, it it's, it, it's all I can do is call our procurement department to put pressure on, you know, as David was saying earlier, to put pressure on the higher ups in that organization to what can we do to try to truncate some of that time. But it, it's, it's completely out of my hands. There's, there's really nothing I can do about it. And so it's, in, from my perspective, it's being honest and upfront from the beginning of the project saying, look, guys, this is what's going on in the market right now. This is what's happening. Here are some examples of what's happened in the past. Here's how we try to protect ourselves against that with early procurement, et cetera. And, but that, but that still is a, you know, is, is no guarantee. I mean, you know, I, in this example, those sterilizers were, were procured three months before we started construction. It, it, you know, I, I ordered them six months ago. I can, I usually can get a sterilizer in six to eight weeks. And I ordered them six months ago, and now they're delayed another two months. So it, it, it's it's just I, to me, it's that ongoing communication and and being being clear upfront. Gavin, any further thoughts on um, client communication about the supply chain? Uh, look, I, I think you know our clients are very well informed. The, the you know it's it's on the front page of more or less every every uh, newspaper or trade journal that we all subscribe to. Um, and I, but I, I, I would tell you that the, uh, there's an expectation on our part and it's, it's obviously a rule to, to demonstrate to the client that um, we've you know, left no a stone unturned and we've deployed every initiative at our disposal. And I, I do just wanna share one thing very briefly. Um, relationships really matter. Um, when a subcontractor invites you to go to the quarry in Turkey or a cabinet shop in Italy or a glass plant in Germany, go. It's not just a boondoggle. Um, you might get to enjoy the local food and maybe an occasional glass of wine, but it does give suppliers an opportunity to explain the history of the firm. Very often there's a very proud heritage they want to share with you. You get to visit their plant, you understand how they're shop floors organized, um, it's not all show. It gives you, the client, the end user, an opportunity to build a relationship. And, and when you are getting conflicting information in the future or you know trouble arises, um, knowing who to call, having forged that bond in advance, um, when you're making a plea to skip a production line or quickly remake a item that's arrived defective, and that relationship that you've taken the time to cultivate and nurture can make uh, all the difference. So um, if I can pass on one initiative that we're deploying on all of our projects, take the time to build those relationships because they can really 
change the outcome of your project. Yeah, I, Gavin, I'm really glad you brought that up. It's it, it to me that is key, and and it's also relationships of of me to Gavin, or me to David, to uh, it, it's it, it's the I have to be able to trust everyone on the job to be able to communicate up my ladder, and and it's so it's it's every relationship that you forge and the partnerships that you create early in the projects that that allow you to to come come to these more creative decisions and and to 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 feel a, a trust between the 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 players on the team to to know instinctively when you're making the right decision and when when you think things need to change and just to touch upon the idea of just go ahead michael the um, you know one way to put that in the contract is when we have allowance items you know not don't let it just be a number I mean, talk to each other about well what's the backup of that allowance number where does that value come from and then throughout the progress of the job you could speak about well you know how's that have the assumptions that put into the allowance has that changed has that gone up and down and and, and keeping that part of the uh, dialogue throughout the project i think is another uh, tool in the, in the in the toolbox of how to address these issues thank you michael mindy you had a question mindy williams mac learning <laughs> I did. <laughs> Hi, David. Thank you. Hi, how are um, you? Now I have to scroll up to find my question again. Um, oh, so my question was, are there any predictions for materials that are not currently impacted by the supply chain issues that may be impacted in the future? I asked that question because I listen to the news every morning and we hear about things that are happening globally. So I'm wondering if any of those um, global events will impact future uh, or will impact products in the future yeah, fortunately we're not building buildings out of ukrainian wheat <laughs> be in trouble yes um, exactly uh does anybody have um their little snowball of uh elements that you start you're starting to see issues on that um have not been impacted in the past or not i mean i, I I think off the bat, I would say it's it's the the items, uh, that, you know, some of the things I'm starting to see are are items that are getting affected by other manufacturers who have shortages. So, like you know, David's been talking a lot about parts and pieces from electrical. You know, now as manufacturers of larger scale equipment are starting to deplete their back stock, now they're having trouble getting those parts and pieces. So we see more delays in, in air handlers. We see, I start seeing delays in medical equipment because they're having more trouble getting those parts and pieces from the manufacturers because they're trying to get them. We're vying for them. Everyone's vying for them. And, and, and who wins is, you know, is, is the question of the day. Thank you. Ivan, you had a question. Ivan? Cavices? Could I read it out, David? Yes, please, go ahead. So, so considering pre-construction time has become much more critical due to supply chain crunches, is there an anticipated shift of contract types from stipulated sum to more GC plus fee, cost plus from clients and CMs to help create a longer pre-construction period to help further validate timeframes for goods. I'll put that in Michael's lap uh, and what you're seeing in terms of trends and contracting in the New York metro area. Sure, and I think Ivan's uh, assumptions are, are spot on. I, I have seen an increase in, in our practice here of, of going to cost plus agreements uh, with the, uh, you know, owners and their more reliable contractors and those partnerships uh, working to make a very comfortable cost plus agreements without a uh, sometimes without a GMP. Uh, I, I used to see only a couple maybe a year but I am seeing more within the last two years so that is definitely a trend and obviously the pre-construction aspect is something that's I think helps and I think more parties are looking at getting the the contractors on board in the project sooner and, uh, and I joke around because a lot of contractors call that free con because they very often give the pre-construction services as a condition of getting their, the larger job and they'll do it for you know, minimal cost, if not none. 
uh, or they'll they'll supplement the cost of their construction if assuming they win the job and and so those are all elements that are for, uh, have become occasional prior, previously, but now have become paramount. Does anybody see a brighter picture in 2022 where we won't be discussing supply chain in 2023? David, I, I would say we're, all of us, I think are focused on the fact of understanding the supply chain better. I think we always knew, quote unquote, that it was there and the issues with it. I think COVID has really given us the impetus to, to really focus in a much more strategic way upon it, and then also look at disruptions in the supply chain about different ways of contracting. Um, there was a report done recently, the new normal in construction it's called. Um, very, very interesting as to what the prediction is there with regard to how supply chain can be realigned. It's fairly far out there. Um, I would say that's not a five-year plan. It's probably further out than that, but the disruption that happened as regards Amazon, I think could happen potentially in our industry as well. So the visibility that we have throughout the, the supply chain at the minute is, is pretty lacking. So uh, really focusing more on that and mapping it and understanding it better is the first step. And I think there's much more to come with that. So that's, that's definitely a big focus of mine and something we're trying to concentrate on. Yeah, D David, I would just comment. I think we're going to be talking a lot more about the availability of labor uh, next year than we are this year. There's a strong industry expectation that the infrastructure dollars will start to start to flow uh, at some point in 23, and the demands that will that will place on organized labor will be um, significant and will have a material impact. Um, you know, across our, our state in terms of availability of labor and resultant cost uh, to get work done. So I think there'll be a much, a much more um, significant labor discussion uh, to be had um, at the next panel. You know, I think I think Mindy, I think Mindy puts a good comment in the uh, in the in the chat over here. What's normal? Um, because I, I I don't think there will be a return to quote unquote normal. I think we're we're at a point now where we're figuring out how to shift with all of our different partners into what will become a new normal. That things are not going to return to what they were pre pandemic. That they're going to evolve into something new and a new way of doing business between all the partners as we push towards completed construction projects. Stephen, do you want to? Yes, I think we need to wrap up. So yeah, thanks a lot, David. Um, thanks, Gavin. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Michael. And thanks, David Hamilton. Um, just a quick shout out that we have our next panel on March the 9th, which is portfolio flexibility and the future of occupancy planning. Um, Tommy, do you want to say anything more or should we make it wrap? Just another thanks to our panelists and to all our attendees. We hope you gain value out of it. It's recorded. And if you'd like to see it, it'll be distributed. But uh, the day after that event on the 9th too, speaking back to in person, our delayed New Year's party at the Rainbow Room will be on the 10th. So uh, love to see it's It's a members only event. But if you're a member here, we'd love to see you sign up and, and get you out in person. So thank you to everybody and appreciate it, Stephen and your team. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good day. Thanks all. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks everyone. Be well.